Welcome to Strategy Conversation, a virtual discussion program of Bangladesh Institute of Peace and Security Studies. Our guest today is Alice Sale, who is joining us from Washington, D.C. Alice, welcome. Oh, welcome to you. Thank you. Let me first begin by briefly introducing our guest today. Alice Sill is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow for Energy and the Environment at the Council on Foreign Relations. Her work at CFR focuses on the risk, consequences, and the responses associated with climate change. Hill previously served as Special Assistant to President Barack Obama and Senior Director for Resilient Policy on the National Security Council staff at the White House. Her co-authored book, Building a Resilient Tomorrow, was published in 2019. In 2020, Yale University awarded her the Public Voices Fellowship on Climate Crisis. In 2016, Harvard University's National Preparedness Leadership Initiative also named her a Meta Leader of the Year. So with that very brief introduction, once again, thank you, Alice, for joining us today. And I'm looking forward to a very interesting session of discussion with you. As thank you, you all know that to join you. the most burning question of interest today around the world is the US election. And with about 11 days left for the US presidential election. What is the general outlook there? Well, Vice President Biden is winning in the polling that's been released. But of course, uh, in 2016, the United States experienced um, a surprise in, when President Trump was elected. The polls had shown that Hillary Clinton would be the next president of the United States. So no one is quite sure what will happen on November 3rd. We have seen record amounts of voting occurring by mail and in advance. I read recently 47 million Americans have already voted before November 3rd. But of course, no one knows what's in those ballots or what will be in the ballots that are cast on November 3rd. Quite naturally, the last presidential debate that was held I think this morning in Bangladesh time was quite interesting. So what are your key takeaways from there? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear the question. The presidential debate that was held, uh, it was uh, quite a marked change from the first debate, which was almost not a debate. So what are your key takeaways from the last presidential debate that was just held? Well, President Trump uh, presented a, a calmer appearance than he did in the last debate, uh, as did, frankly, Vice President Biden. The discussions were more substantive, uh, and they also showed the deep divide in policies that will be pursued under the different administrations. For the issue that I most closely follow, climate change, uh, there is really um, polar opposites in the approaches these candidates take. So that was on display. It was a better debate than we've seen, but the polling also shows that many voters are not swayed by a particular presidential debate. It's more an exercise of people being able to see the candidates on TV and uh, talk about that amongst themselves while it occurs. Yeah, I also saw the debate and I found the substance was much better than the last time. Yes. But then, and Vice President Biden clearly laid out some of the policy guidelines that he would follow. I also remember in our meeting with you in the White House, you did mention then that there is a deep commitment of the United States towards climate policy and Vice President Biden highlighted some of those in his statement during the debate. What do you, how would you explain that? Well, I, 
anticipate that uh, Vice President Obama will, uh, excuse me, uh, Biden will build on what President Obama started under his administration. But of course, the threat from climate change has worsened in the last four years. We're seeing more events happen more quickly, frankly, than we anticipated. More damage occurring worldwide, including in the United States. And as Vice President Biden said last night, it's an existential threat to the planet. So I think you will see far more activity under Vice President Biden than even occurred under President Obama, simply because there's greater appreciation of what's at stake now than there was then. Yeah, I understand that. So with a potential Biden presidency, how do you see the policy orientation that will change? You can just highlight a few. Yes. Well, of course, we will immediately see the United States rejoin the Paris Agreement. Uh, that officially uh, ends on November 3rd, excuse me, November 4th, the day after the election. But if Vice President Biden's elected as president, the United States will rejoin. Uh, his platform calls out that the United States will attempt to assume, again, a leadership position uh, worldwide. Of course, uh, we'll have to do that a bit humbly since we so rapidly exited from the Paris Agreement. You'll see large investment here in the United States, uh, about a $2, billion, $2 trillion package, US dollars, to address climate change, a transition to clean electricity by 2035 and net neutral by 2050 also building greater resilience in the United States. Diplomatically, I think that you will see greater contributions by the United States to the Green Climate Fund and other efforts to help with adaptation uh, worldwide, particularly to obviously those countries who've had the least to do with causing the climate crisis, but are very vulnerable to its impacts. Do you also see that the United States will re-engage the world on other key issues in which the United States has been withdrawing for the last few years? Oh, absolutely. I, I do think that you will see re-engagement by the United States in a way uh, in Asia, uh, less confrontational. China will re remain a serious concern, uh, but an attempt to rebuild relationships with our allies and partners in Southeast Asia uh, to have a better rapport and find commonalities where we can build together on tech and other issues in ways that have not been pursued under the Trump administration. So would that also include an United States policy towards South Asia that would be more intensely engaging? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear more investing in would that also mean that the United States will engage South Asia more closely on various key issues? I believe so. I think you'll see uh, much more interest in multilateral organizations again. Uh, Tr President Trump has carved out a go it alone approach, but I think President Biden through his long history of serving in the government has shown that his is one of multilateral, bilateral agreements. So you'll see in the ASEAN uh, and other fora that the United States will be more present, uh, showing up, uh, if you will, and making uh, itself uh, more helpful and being more involved going forward if Vice President Biden were to win. So that also means that the United States will be more closely working with its international partners, its allies, and also multilateral platforms? Absolutely. I think you'll see an attempt to return to multilateralism. We've seen uh, President Trump withdraw from WHO, uh, threatened to withdraw uh, support for, um, uh, to NATO, uh, threatened to withdraw support to Japan and South Korea uh, militarily. I think that you will see the United States return uh, to fulfilling some of those commitments. There may be adjustments along the way, but certainly it will be uh, resemble more closely what you experienced uh, under prior administrations before President Trump were, was elected. We are currently witnessing a rift in the Sino-US relationship. It is also coming to the point of an 
all these strategic competition, but also strategic tension. How would you see the trajectory going forward? Well, I think the United States will, if uh, Biden were elected, uh, would try to repair those relationships uh, and return to what President Obama was trying to do with the so-called Asia pivot, to be more attentive to concerns there. Obviously, countering China's influence will remain an important strategic goal. Uh, and we'll see, as we've seen more recently with the um, um, quadrilateral uh, initiative, we will see more engagement with nations to counter some of the influence of China. Uh, but the United States will, of course, uh, pay attention to its own interests as well uh, as it pursues these goals. But I think it will under Biden, try to resume more of a leadership position versus a stay at home position. And um, that will be uh, a welcome change for many in the uh, diplomatic community as, though, as well as those who work in development because the United States has historically played such an important role in helping other nations succeed in their endeavors. So in that kind of relationship, we also see that the current standoff for the tension between India and China that is happening in its borders. Will that be an issue that the United States will also take up? That I don't know. Um, but certainly uh, India is an important ally for us and uh, we will continue to build that relationship to make sure that we are uh, focusing on our uh, allies within uh, Southeast Asia. So um, I think that we will um, build that relationship as to what our reaction will be in terms of India and China. I don't know, um, but it was interesting to see that um, India, uh, it was going to uh, allow Australia or agree to Australia participating in the exercises recently. Um, so I think we'll see more of a united front um, going forward. Uh Together with that, we also see signs of Sino-US decoupling, especially decoupling on the issues of trade and economy. How will that affect the global economy in, in general? And in particular, I'm also asking, will that affect the supply chain management that we have established globally? I'm sorry, I, I didn't understand the question. We see trends of decoupling between the United States and China. So will that have an effect on the international and the global economy? And in particular, will that have an effect on the supply chain management system on which we have all become dependent? I think so. I think COVID-19 is going to have profound effects on our understanding of the global supply chain. Of course, uh, we've had a global supply chain for centuries, but what we're seeing is uh, greater concentration in certain areas that has made it more vulnerable to climate change impacts, as well as the impacts from COVID, where the United States found that China was manufacturing a lot of the personal protective equipment, and we had assumed that we would have that available for our own citizens in the United States, and that chain broke down early on in the COVID-19 uh, outbreak. So I do anticipate that there'll be lasting ramifications for the supply chain. I also think uh, that the United States wants to not um, cede to China a lot of the uh, areas where China has made a substantial ploy, both in the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as in artificial intelligence, uh, 5G, other areas of tech. The United States will want to be um, present in that uh, area of commerce and, and worldwide trade going forward. So will the Biden administration more or less follow the same China policy or there'll be a major shift? I think that uh, you'll see similarities on the China policy in terms of uh, the push to contain China uh, in a way that we've uh, uh, 
President Trump has made very clear that's his goal. I think that the Biden administration, based on my understanding, will continue to try to contain China. But I think you'll see a pullback from uh, the escalation of tension between the nations. I think that um, Vice President Biden has a long history in foreign policy and a deep interest. And that uh, focus for his many years has been on multilateralism. So I think that you will see a push to return to those roots as well as understand that uh, China in flexing its muscles uh, needs to be uh, addressed and we need to see what their posture is in determining how we will approach China going forward. Yeah, I understand that. So one of the key strategic initiatives that the United States is currently pursuing is in the Pacific strategy. So how do you see the Indo-Pacific strategy or IPS going forward? Well, I think that you'll see a um, return to uh, uh, what uh, President Obama set forward, but I think that you'll see a more uh, sensitive approach in terms of uh, U.S. interests and in terms of uh, trying to make sure that we understand how the world continues to change in its configuration, uh, particularly as China uh, rises more as a global power. Uh, we'll also continue to need to focus on North Korea. I think you'll see far less um, of a, uh, a far less warmth shown, shown to North Korea than we've seen under the uh, Trump administration. And we will certainly be looking to repair our relationships with South Korea uh, going forward um, and making sure that we are known as a better partner than we have in the most recent past. Yeah, thank you. Um, a reason that worries us all, the world has really been hit hard by the pandemic. So how do you see this ending? And what are the grave consequences that it will leave behind? Well, of course, we don't know uh, when it will end, when there'll be a vaccine available worldwide, how effective that vaccine will be, and what the immunity will be for people uh, going forward. But beyond that, I think the one thing that this pandemic has shown is that there'll be another pandemic behind it. And it, that pandemic may even be more lethal than this, this current uh, COVID-19. So uh, I believe that nations in the United States will take this experience to heart in terms of finally focusing on better preparedness of public health. And that will include uh, internationally, because we need to improve our monitoring, our disease detection, our ability to cooperate uh, against a threat that ha knows no borders. Uh, and uh, if you're an island nation, it's a little simpler uh, to close your borders. So we've seen some great success in Taiwan, New Zealand. But for other countries uh, that share borders, it becomes more complex to contain the disease. And uh, going forward, we'll need to stop it in its tracks earlier. Uh, in the United States, in my opinion, there's no question that the reason this disease has infiltrated so deeply and is very rapidly replicating right at this moment uh, we are anticipated to see many, many more deaths in the coming uh, weeks. And the reason for that is that the United States under President Trump failed to act quickly enough. Um, it simply ignored the reports, reassured, President Trump reassured falsely the United States that the disease would disappear and that it was nothing to worry about. But more, even more damaging is he did not take the necessary steps to make sure that um, we shut down the spread of the disease internally within the United States um, as soon as it entered. Basically ignored the warnings of our uh, public health experts as to how to contain a disease, despite having 
some of the best planning in place for exactly what occurred here with COVID-19. Yeah. I know, Alice, in 2019, you also served as a senior counselor to the Secretary of U.S. Department of Homeless Security, where you also led the formulation of DHS's first ever climate adaptation plan and the development of strategic plans regarding catastrophic biological and chemical threats, including pandemics. So the United States was in a position that it had the best capacity for preparedness. So what went completely wrong that United States today is one of the most affected country with over 220,000 deaths. And even I see in today's figures, 73,000 infection in 20, last 24 hours. So it is really going bad. So even I also see that in the Obama White House, you served for many years. There was also a pandemic capacity within the National Security Council where you were serving. So what happened to all those? Well, as I said, uh, we had a failure of leadership. So this disease was detected uh, in late December uh, in at least in very early January 2020, the White House was well aware. When President Obama was leaving the White House, one of the deep concerns was preparations for the pandemic. So under his leadership, including when I was in the White House and when I was in the Department of Homeland Security, there was a focus on biological threats, both man-made as well as naturally occurring like this particular pandemic. And through that, there was uh, widespread planning. Uh, there were efforts to increase coordination there were a number of exercises or tabletop exercises to look at different biological threats. One of those occurred right before the transition from the Obama team to the, um, to the Trump team. And the purpose of that exercise was to raise the red flag that we are at grave risk of a worldwide pandemic. Unfortunately, President Trump basically ignored the reports that he was receiving from his own intelligence community, his own biological survey, a surveillance unit, and simply did not take action. You know, I remember receiving emails from friends within the federal government, basically saying, what is going on? Why doesn't President Trump act? We're only at just a few days, if you recall, Italy was closing down very rapidly at that time. We're just a few days behind Italy in terms of the spread of the disease. But President Trump decided, as he's recently admitted, to lie to the American people and tell them that it would all be fine. He didn't want to affect our markets our financial markets. So he lied to the American people, refused to wear a mask, which we know is the best way, one of the best ways to contain the spread, refused to social distance. And so his example has created a um, debate in the United States as to whether we should wear masks, social distance, similar to the debate whether there's climate change occurring. Because of course, President Trump has famously said climate change is a hoax. So his rejection of the science meant that the United States was set on a course where the disease would inevitably spread. We need to take early action to stop a disease. That's the one thing that's very clear from any public health authority. We didn't do that. And now we have very mixed messages from our central, uh, our Center for Disease Control, our federal agency, internationally recognized as one of the best, but a complete failure right now in terms of setting policy nationally for the United States on how best to address these issues. So multiple points of failure, not that the plan was perfect under President Obama or any other president, but certainly the execution of the plan under President Trump was very poor and the American people are paying the consequences and some families are losing their loved ones as a result of choices made by his team. Yeah. But Alice, you also mentioned that there will be probably a follow-on pandemic or a future pandemic coming soon. So in what form or shape, 
What, what is your forecasting for that? Well, it's very difficult to predict these pandemics. That's why uh, we see that even though everyone said it's a question of when, not if, I even wrote in 2017 on the 99th anniversary of the 2018 pandemic, uh, a piece that just said that. So, but it's very difficult to um, pinpoint exactly when. I think public health experts now say that this could be much sooner than a century between these pandemics that we recently saw. We had warnings with MERS, SARS, H1N1, that pandemics were likely, Ebola. We contained those. Uh, but it's with this, we did not successfully contain it. And there is further risk that a, a similar, more lethal um, virus could emerge, um, perhaps uh, some form of flu. And uh, my organization, the Council on Foreign Rela Relations, just issued a report urging for greater public health me measures internationally precisely to address this rapidly changing threat picture because we are more interconnected. We do live closer to animals, which can easily mean that the disease is spread. We have climate change, which is changing the vectors of certain insects. So we have elements that are increasing our risk, but we have not responded adequately in building out our public health capabilities as well as our surveillance abilities internationally and nationally here in the United States. But do you think the international cooperation that should have worked for a global pandemic, have we worked in that manner or we went on the specter of blaming each other or not even supporting the WHO, for example? My personal opinion is that multilateralism is the only way that we can go forward in terms of uh, governing in a highly interconnected world. Um, the threats that we're seeing cross borders. They don't care about the jurisdictional boundaries that humans have set up. Uh, and as they cross boundaries, we need to figure out how to work together to protect all of us. So I suspect as there's greater understanding of this threat, there will be a turn back to multilateralism because we're seeing uh, that we cannot simply shut down our borders and expect that harm doesn't occur. Very similar situation with climate change. If we shut our borders, say, we're not going to worry about the other countries of the world that are suffering these terrible impacts, we're going to see um, a growth in terrorism, I'm afraid, uh, international crime, uh, transnational crime, because as countries struggle to address these impacts. It provides opportunities for bad actors to take over and seize the moment, recruit members, uh, be a substitute for the government. And in the long run, that threatens global security, including the security of the United States. So we need to work to help everyone thrive in a world that's changing very quickly. I also know that you have also done work with biothreats. So what sort of biothreats uh, the world could be looking at or should be preparing for now? Well, we have uh, naturally occurring and man-made. Uh, of course, there's great concern that there could be a mass casualty event from a man-made terrorist attack. Um, one such type of terrorist attack would be an aerosolized anthrax attack, which could go undetected for a certain amount of time and kill uh, hundreds of thousands in multiple cities at once. Very difficult problem because if you don't get medical countermeasures to people, typically some kind of um, uh, antibiotic within 72 hours, uh, there's a very high morbidity rate. So a really complex problem uh, to address, but that is one fear um, that we would see uh, and the growth of other pathogens used uh, in a intentional manner to harm uh, and to uh, format terrorism. Uh, or it could be a state actor. I mean, that would be another very grave concern. Obviously, uh, the concerns with Russia and its use of um, uh, uh, bioweapons uh, you know, to target uh, individuals who uh, disagree with uh, 
Putin. So we, those are man-made. Uh, and then, of course, we have pathogen spreading. And with climate change, I think that's a serious concern. We're having seeing uh, malaria-borne diseases, excuse me, mosquito-borne diseases in areas that we have not previously experienced. Uh, we're seeing the United States tick-borne diseases spreading uh, to further climates. And um, in many instances, uh, some of the animals that are in our northern uh, part of the United States just simply um, uh, cannot handle the type of uh, insect evasion we're already seeing. So we see moose dying uh, from uh, ticks uh, uh, killing them. Uh, we're also seeing um, algae blooms and other uh, diseases pass through both fresh and uh, ocean water uh, because bacteria in warmer waters thrive and some of that bacteria is deadly. So we've seen in fresh waters uh, a type of bacteria moving northward in the United States, as well as um, a flesh eating bacteria in some of our coastal areas. We're just going to see more and more public health threats as our environment changes and some uh, new uh, threats will emerge that we didn't have to worry about before because the conditions weren't conducive to their spread. Alice, you briefly mentioned before about the kind of the looming tech war that we are entering. So there is now conflict over 5G. There are issues of artificial intelligence and robotics. There are now competition over the use of space. So how do you think the tech war will shape in the future? That's a hard thing to predict. One thing I know is that humans aren't particularly good at predicting, although I've done a lot of predicting here today. Um, I don't uh, see it. I do know that um, the United States, just based on its ambitions, will continue to want to um, be a major player. I think the tech war um, is revealing that there are some consequences, just as with climate change, that we did not understand before. Uh, certainly privacy, human rights issues um, that we simply did not appreciate as this technology took over the world and has become uh, so important for all of us including during uh, COVID-19. Uh, but we're seeing in the United States under the Trump administration an antitrust uh, uh, lawsuit just filed against Google. Um, so this is an area that's in flux. I think it's very difficult once a technology has been unleashed and we've unleashed many social media platforms, other things. Uh, we've got artificial intelligence helping us in many areas but it could be used in a very perverse manner. The one thing we know, it's very hard to pull that back. And um, now it's there. Uh, and so uh, it could mean a lot more surveillance. I hope that that doesn't infringe on basic democratic principles uh, and undermine our ability to have democracies thrive. Um, but if, certainly if used by bad actors, it could um, affect and undermine, as we've seen in our current elections, uh, voting. And that is a poor development, but we haven't figured out how to, uh, how to fix that yet. I hope we can. I just saw that there was a recent briefing by FBI about Russian and Iranian interference to social media. How pervasive is that? How big is that? Well, I, I can't uh, say, I don't know, but it is a major concern. It's been a major concern from the 2016 election, although President Trump, uh, not probably surprisingly, has denied or downplayed the influence, but certainly our intelligence op um, operations and agencies here have said that Russia had a deep influence on our 2016 election, which turned out to be extremely close. Um, and um, the concern is that similar uh, efforts are afoot now. Uh, hard to tell real time how that's going on. And of course, the tech platforms are one of the primary ways this occurs. Uh, we know that Russians uh, used our um, social media accounts uh, to uh, 
push information uh, to uh, favor President Trump. And the fear is that the similar is occurring now. Uh, Alice, this is something that you understand best. What is the, uh, how would you explain the interface between climate change impacts and national security and international security? Or what would be the comprehensive nature of the security implications of climate change? Climate change will fundamentally undermine global security um, because as these impacts come in, uh, they will test the governance structures in communities, in countries going forward. Uh, and they will, um, of course, cause death. They'll cause economic loss. They'll cause hunger um, and really threaten human security. As that occurs, it can um, cause global security to come under a great deal of stress. Unfortunately, we haven't seen a reckoning of the international threat uh, posed by climate change. The UN has had a number of debates on the issue, but they haven't truly embraced the issue. The Munich Security Conference, the largest uh, convening of national security leaders uh, in the world, only for the first time got national security and climate change on the center stage this year. It just has been a back burner issue number of very serious uh, efforts afoot, but nothing has taken hold. I personally led the development of an executive order for President Obama um, on the issue of national security and climate change to help the United States better understand what's happening worldwide, take that information through its intelligence uh, community and provide it to policymakers as they make decisions about diplomacy, development support, all the issues that we think of when we're thinking about our relationships with our allies and other countries throughout the world. President Trump pulled that, um, rescinded that order almost immediately when he took office. So not much is occurring right now on the issue. But of course, the impacts are worsening and we are seeing much more evidence of climate change. So as we go forward, that will be another uh, issue for a newly elected uh, President Biden, should he be elected to attend to, because um, if we don't, we will not address the migration, uh, the famine, uh, and the serious undermining of livelihoods that will occur with climate change impacts. So one of the issues that as a low-lying riverine delta country like Bangladesh or many other island states, are the critical issue of the sea level rise. And it is also my understanding that in some cases, some of the impacts of sea level rise is almost irreversible now. So how do we assess the kind of human displacement that it will cause? Or what are the other grave consequences of sea level rise we should be prepared to see in the coming decades? Well, sea level rise, uh, as uh, you are well aware, um, will cause coastal erosion. It will cause homes to be flooded routinely. Um, and it will, uh, if there's storm surge, go much deeper into uh, land, perhaps ruining agricultural lands. So many consequences uh, from this rise, which will accelerate going forward. And you're absolutely right is permanent, as are um, uh, some other changes from climate change, such as bi uh, biodiversity loss. I think that Bangladesh, uh, in fact, in our book, we cited uh, some of the efforts that are occurring there as really a model for the world, trying to plan where will people go in advance of these events, forcing them to leave their homes, trying to help them transition into places that are prepared to receive them. Because if you have a sudden influx of people into a community, that can exacerbate stresses when the schools are overflowing, when there aren't enough services available, water becomes uh, scarce, whatever may occur. So planning and supporting communities, both as people leave, but importantly, as they begin to receive them is critical. We have nothing like that happening in the United States. We are still at the point where there's major development occurring 
you know, along our coastlines. In fact, more development occurs in at-risk areas in some states than it does at risk of flooding and sea level rise than it does in not at-risk areas. So we need to change our paradigm very quickly because basically so far for almost, um, in almost all areas, there's been little recognition of what's truly ex at stake including the fact that the seas will rise much more quickly. And there could be a even more rapid sea level rise, depending on whether ice sheets melt at a faster rate than our modeling has shown. But one of the problems that I foresee is that for large scale displacement, for example, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, about 70 to 20% territory is likely to be lost to the sea as per the IPCC's projections that will create a climate refugee population of about 30 million plus. So when that happens, then the large scale displacement will also involve transboundary migration. So is the international community thinking about it or are they preparing about it? Because that can completely destabilize the region and the international system. Well, I think there's beginning uh, to be talk about this problem, uh, but certainly our agreements that we have worldwide just simply don't fit this uh, new threat. We have uh, refugee programs, but a uh, climate migrant might not uh, fall within the strict definition of a refugee. So as we go forward, we need to adjust our international system to accommodate the levels of displacement that we will see. Of course, people will first be internally displaced in many countries, and then they will have transboundary uh, migration as well. We do not see in the United States any um, serious discussion of what this will mean, even though on our Southern border, we have seen Central Americans appear in record numbers, causing deep distress to the Trump administration and challenges to the Obama administration as well. And those refugees or those uh, migrants are uh, in some parts driven by climate change, drought in Central America, which has uh, decimated the coffee crop, uh, coffee rust uh, has occurred on the plants, uh, as well as uh, vulnerability to storms, causing uh, the infiltration of gangs uh, and uh, making those countries increasingly violent. So we see more uh, migrants moving northward. That's a, a snapshot of what's ahead but our institute, international institutions have not uh, tackled this in the manner that they will need to. It will happen quickly, in my opinion. Some of it will be slower moving as in drought, but look at what happened with Europe, with the Syrians after um, when there was unrest and underneath that was a 1200 year drought, 5 million um, heading towards Europe and how difficult that was for Europe to address. We, of course, as you've said, are going to see many, many more millions than that, and there is not the structure in place. One of the interesting proposals I saw is that um, for those countries that have been among the largest emitters, of course, that includes the United States, that there should be perhaps a system where they uh, receive uh, more migrants in recognition of the harm they've caused to these countries, forcing people to move. Um, I don't see that in the immediate future on the world stage, but certainly it's a compelling argument in terms of uh, who bears responsibility for the heat that we are experiencing worldwide. And so how do you see the future of the Paris Agreement? Do you well, think I, I, I'm sorry. In terms of the implementation. Well, I hope that there's uh, greater ambition uh, expressed. Um, it was disappointing to see the COP um, put off uh, because of COVID. We've had many successful uh, meetings over Zoom, uh, but I think that um, as we go forward, I'm hoping that there is more ambition expressed. 
Um, we saw China during climate week um, come forward with more aggressive timetables. Certainly the United States, I hope, comes back with a more aggressive timetable. Um, but as has been pointed out by many, what we had under Paris was not going to get us to safety. Uh, we need to have a far greater uh, movement towards um, a fossil free um, future, fossil fuel free future, uh, as well as finding ways to take some of the carbon that's already there out of uh, the atmosphere. Uh, it's deeply concerning uh, what will happen in just a, you know, not that far off uh, in terms of if we hit the kinds of temperatures that are predicted a three or four degree world. Um, it's hard to see how that's livable for many uh, in the world. It will challenge every nation, but it will challenge certainly uh, some who already have uh, live in hot, hotter areas with more humidity. So I think we need to um, double down, get serious. COVID-19, unfortunately, was not the impetus to doing that. And there haven't been sufficient moves for green recovery, in my opinion. Uh, there really uh, hasn't been the kind of concerted effort to make sure that what we do as we build back from COVID-19 addresses this other very large looming threat. I'm hoping that turns around, um, but the bottom line is we knew all need to do a lot more. Uh, you just briefly touched so do you think there's a place for geoengineering in the effort to solve it? Because I see and read that many people talk about it without understanding the consequences. Well, I am uh, not a uh, fan this at this point of relying on geoengineering as a solution to our problems, so particularly the kind of uh, solar... Um, radiation where you try to kick back some of the um, uh, sunlight back into the atmosphere. I think that even under the Paris Agreement, we're going to have to have the kind of geoengineering of sequestering carbon or um, uh, trying to uh, take some carbon out. But uh, plans to have planes fly daily missions to put uh, up some kind of reflective material to keep us safe or spreading iron uh, in the seas or silica over uh, the Arctic. All of those make me nervous. Uh, if we don't understand our atmosphere with carbon, it's hard for me to believe we better understand adding more things to uh, the atmosphere to keep us safe. And of course, with geoengineering, uh, with some of these methods, if we chose to stop, it could lead to a very rapid um, heating of the globe, which would be devastating if it occurred so quickly. So um, that's another area that's going to need to have uh, global governance. And we don't have a system yet. So we can have yeah, billionaires not. or nations doing this on their own. And um, one interesting point uh, I, I would just add in the national security memorandum or uh, uh, executive order that President Obama signed that I developed, we explicitly called on our intelligence agencies to monitor geoengineering. I think it's important that we have a system to watch what's going on so that we understand if nations or billionaires decide to attempt to alter our atmosphere, we should all be aware of that. Um, and at least understand what's occurring. Uh, but because that order got pulled, I don't know if the federal government in the United States is actively looking at that issue yet. I imagine they will going forward if Vice President Biden is elected. I really hope that somebody is watching because this could have otherwise grave consequences. And yes. so the, I know Vice President Biden today in the debate talked about energy transition to clean energy. So how difficult will the transition be on, with countries who are totally dependent financially on fossil fuel exports, like the Middle East, for example? Do you think, are we preparing them enough for the transition? No. Uh, I think that's why we're seeing so much resistance uh, to a transition. Uh, and we are not preparing enough in the United States. 
um, and our, it's, the transition will be painful. Uh, what we need to focus on is um, helping those countries um, as well as uh, the communities within the United States, for example, uh, find other ways to thrive. Uh, but collectively, our dependence on fossil fuels uh, will, as we recently heard, could cut global GDP by 2100 by 25 percent. So it's not economically sustainable for us to continue to heat up. Um, and uh, at some point we will economically lose, uh, but it would be better to incur the pain now, uh, in my opinion, and put, keep postponing this, continuing to heat up uh, and suffering irreversible harm uh, in the hopes that somehow this is going to go away. Uh, we have set ourselves on a trajectory. We can take urgent action now to alter the course, but uh, of course we're gonna see people who depend on prior choices for energy that will fight that. And this means that we need to help those people find a way forward so that they can thrive as well in a new environment that's going to have to rely on clean energy. What would be your recommendations for building more resilience in the face of climate change and also in the face of energy transition at the level of society, community, and even at the level of the state? What are the recommendations or steps that you take? I think that climate resilience has to be embedded in every decision that we make. Um, and that would require that all um, planning done by different state entities um, consider, does this decision we're taking get impacted by the climate impacts we can anticipate over the life of the project? This is particularly acute in the area of infrastructure, because if you're hoping that a bridge lasts a hundred years and it's, my engineers friends say it's better if it lasts even longer, uh, you better account for what sea level rise will do, what higher wind speeds, more heat, uh, and more extreme rainfall may um, affect, how that could affect that bridge. Uh, so in any engineering decision, but also decisions about where you're gonna put your public health money, where you're going to put your transportation systems, how you're going to harden them, uh, what kind of technologies you rely on, do they perform well in more extreme conditions? All of those uh, decisions need to be reviewed through a uh, climate lens as we invest very precious dollars. An important place to start this is with new builds because it's a lot cheaper um, to build uh, in resilience from the get-go than retrofit. And in this area, as Asia sees the enormous amount of growth in cities that it will see, uh, I think the estimate is uh, a new Paris um, every month, uh, or every week, I'm sorry, New, new York every month, uh, that's a chance for us to make sure it's done resiliently, thinking through what are the land use choices and what are the building standards that will make sure that what we invest in lasts. And then uh, for, uh, countries like the United States that has a lot of existing infrastructure. We're only going to change about 1% of our built environment every uh, year. We need to be looking at, do we need retrofits? And then land use becomes really critical to get people out of areas that are known risk. Um, and that includes wildfires as we're seeing in our American West, as well as flood regions. So uh, climate resilience has to be a central part of uh, government going forward at every level of government. I think it also should be just of individuals. Um, and one of the challenges here we have in the United States is if you're buying your first home or renting a home, you don't probably know what risk you face. We just don't have good information available. So we see people move towards risk uh, it's either got a beautiful view or it's cheaper or whatever choices they're making, but they're not around whether they're safe and whether they're vulnerable to climate impacts. So a lot to improve in this area. And um, one of the surprising things to me is the divide in climate change between those who talk about 
cutting emissions and those who talk about adaptation. It's um, almost as if they're two different groups. Uh, their timelines can be different, uh, but because they don't uh, overlap in most uh, discussions, meetings, uh, we are at risk of making choices in either area, area that could be detrimental to the goals of climate resilience and cutting emissions. So I also believe that we need to look at this more holistically going forward. So We're losing audio. Would you check your audio, please? Can you oh. hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Did so, I cut off? Yeah, we, we're back. We're back now. Okay. So, Alice, we are coming to the end of the conversation. So, any end thoughts? Well, I just want to say um, I am a deep admirer of Bangladesh uh, and of you and your efforts to keep the threats uh, that the world faces uh, at the forefront, and importantly, talking about solutions uh, for ways that we can do better, uh, for your ability to innovate, to um, really show uh, that it's not a question of necessarily of how much um, how many resources you have, it's really about how resourceful you are. Uh, and with the early warning systems, uh, with the efforts uh, to have people understand the risk of waterborne disease, uh, huge strides made in Bangladesh in terms of reduction of deaths, and then uh, your emphasis, General, on the national security risks that are posed by climate change worldwide. Talk about leadership. There it is. And uh, I'm just a deep admirer of the continued focus on these issues. And I wish we could clone all of those efforts uh, so that we would all have a better future ahead. With that end note and a hope for the future, Alice, I thank you very much for joining me today for this wonderful discussion We've covered a lot of ground, and some of them look bright, some of them not so bright. But I think together, as nations, as countries, as members, citizens of the international community, we should all work together for a brighter future for humanity. That is my hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Stay well and stay safe. Thank you.